It is the liturgical tradition of the church that on the feast of Epiphany, that the announcement of Easter and the movable feasts be proclaimed to the church in the form of a chant. I have the chant, but I'm going to read it. <coughs> know, dear brothers and sisters, that as we have rejoiced at the nativity of our Lord Jesus Christ, so by leave of God's mercy, we announce to you also the joy of his resurrection, who is our Savior. On the 14th day of February will fall Ash Wednesday, and the beginning of the fast of the most sacred Lenten season. On the 31st day of March, you will celebrate with joy Easter Day, the Paschal Feast of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the ninth day of May will be the Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the 19th day of May, the Feast of Pentecost, on the second day of June, the Feast of the Most Holy Body and Blood of Christ. On the first day of December, the first Sunday of Advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom in honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. My brothers and sisters, as you may know by following in our liturgical celebrations at Prince of Peace, I have been taking advantage of the 800th anniversary of the first nativity scene established by St. Francis of Assisi to reflect upon various uh, objects in the nativity scene uh, and reflect upon them in a way to break open the mysteries of Christmas. So I will continue this practice today by reflecting upon two other objects that are usually in the nativity scene. And they're probably of no surprise to you. First will be the, the Magi, and second, the star. But before I go any further, I must do one thing. What point is it talking about the Magi and the Nativity scene if they're not there? I left the camel out since I'm not going to be talking about it anyways. So the Magi, the Magi, there are three, um, three things that we notice about the Magi in the uh, way they behave like disciples in today's gospel reading. They uh, they have these three gestures that they perform. They, they, they see, they set out, and they bear gifts. In being able to see, the Magi had to look at the world differently than most of the other uh, folks around them. They had more of a habit of looking up into the sky to see things rather than paying always attention to the ground. They weren't content 
at just looking at the ground, although they had to, but they also looked up. And by looking up, they were able to see uh, something different, something new, something that was beckoning them. And that is the result of their looking up, of trying to see things a little differently. Most people are familiar with just looking at the ground. They are content, hopefully, with their health, content with the money they have, content with the amount of entertainment they may enjoy. But being content in these ways creates a sterility of a status quo. And it is very difficult to grow. It's very difficult to invite the newness of God that we celebrate this Christmas season. The Magi were able to look up they were able to see God beckoning them outside of the everyday occurrences, which they were also familiar with. After seeing and being able to look up, they had to set out. They didn't just say, oh, look at that star out there. Isn't that something? Uh, they made a conscious decision to advance, to follow this sign to always go forward, to take the risks of making a journey. When Herod heard of this news that the Magi proclaimed to them, Herod did nothing. He stayed in his place and waited for other things to happen. The Magi, on the other hand, decided to go forth. They went forth because as a disciple, they knew that following the star, following Jesus Christ is a continuous journey. And on such continuous journeys, there may be some uh, pitfalls, like mundane gossip, which slows down the pace, like selfish whims, you know, my church, my schedule, my way or no way which paralyzes the entire journey. The pessimism that ensnares hope. For Jesus Christ gives us a future, and ensnaring the hope makes it very difficult to receive that future. They overcome the fears of taking risks. They overcame the, the temptations of self-satisfaction with looking at the ground alone. They refused to, they, they went beyond the refusal to accept more out of life that God could give them. As soon as we decide to take risks to go on a journey, as soon as we decide to advance and move forward, we almost immediately begin to see the worth of our efforts, which then creates a sense of joy, a sense of freedom, that we can only experience on this journey we take. So after looking up, after responding and setting out, they brought gifts. That these magi had this spirit of generosity as disciples, giving for the sake of giving, or perhaps even more, giving for the sake of Jesus. Such generosity opened their hearts to the newness of things in the world, to the newness of God. They discovered that, and we see this by the way they uh, take a different route home after they had been warned. It was the generosity of their heart that enabled them to respond to this sudden newness in their journey. The star that we reflect upon uh, this day. Some see it as a natural phenomenon. Many have tried with various models to try to figure out exactly what that natural phenomenon is. Although there may be many good hypotheses, there is none that satisfies all of the conditions that we see uh, about the star. But what we can 
glean, I believe, from whatever this natural phenomenon was, that whatever it was, whatever the Magi saw by looking up, it must have been something very subtle, something that was not so obvious to see. The stars in their day in the sky were much more, they could see much, much more than we can see today. In the day of the Magi, even the bright constellations of, of Orion were difficult to discern because there were many more stars around. So whatever it was, the Magi were paying attention and were able to see it. This natural phenomenon of the star suggests that God does not always overwhelm us with God's revelation, that God tends to be more subtle, for he wants us to respond to God's own invitation. Sometimes flashy things can be a little more forceful and intimidate our freedom. There is also the biblical aspect of the star, a star that led the Magi. It's not unusual for God to lead people in this way. We can recall the pillar of fire, the pillar of smoke that laid in the tent, the resting place of the Lord, and the people's journey through the desert. When the smoke was in the tabernacle, everybody stayed put. And when the smoke arose and started to move, people started to follow. This seems to be this nature of the star at its rising, that it led the Magi first to uh, Jerusalem, where it stopped for a while for them to ascertain what they needed to learn. And then the star continued and led them uh, to Bethlehem. There is also another star that is in the that is in the uh, is in sacred scripture, which is, I think, perhaps the greatest connection of the star in Matthew uh, and its greatest significance in the reading. The other star was seen by another magus, who blessed Israel after being paid by a, an evil king to curse them. And Balaam, this Magus, in his fourth oracle in the book of Numbers, says this, I see him, though not now. I observe him, though not near. A star shall advance from Jacob, and a scepter shall rise from Israel. That the star seemed to suggest a person, suggest a savior, suggest perhaps even King David or his descendant, that of Jesus. And, and notice how the star is. It, it's like here, one can see, but not now, can observe, but, is, but not near. This, this paradox in experiencing the star at its rising, which leads to the fact that the star, whether it be a natural phenomenon or biblical image is God's beacon, leading us and calling us to, to Jesus who saves us. It leads us to an unknown future with Christ that is a gift from God, an unknown future that requires hope, that requires openness, requires a, a receptivity to newness in order to receive. The star gives us a sense of being guided by a tender God and not abandoned to karma or other forms of blind fate. So the Magi and the star need one another. What good are the Magi if they don't have a star to follow? What good is the radiance of God's glory in the star if there was no one to behold it and respond to it. We as 
the Magi, when we look at the Magi, we learn that it's a plural word. Magus is the singular, Magi is the plural. We don't know not really how many magi there were that beheld the star. We know that it was more than one. It could be two. We usually say it's three because of the gifts that they bring. There are three. But they could have been 12. They could have been 120. We don't really know. We just know there was more than one. This suggests that magi, the magi, like disciples, best respond to God together in a community, that discipleship isn't an individual endeavor. It's something that is done together. And we as a church are that magi that follow God in God's newness into this unknown future. And we can travel this journey together with lifelong learning of our faith, with studies of sacred scripture. Even the magi consult that in the gospel and with the celebration of our sacraments. The star and the magi show our relationship with God that is established in the Christmas mysteries, that God always leads us, but God also, in leading us, is always with us. St. Bernard said to some travelers, some pilgrims preparing to go to Rome, he said, you will not find Christ in Rome unless you have him with you as you set out on the journey. So look up, pay attention, make a decision to, to, uh, to advance and go forward. Be generous, and the joys and freedoms of God will fill us and be abounding with great fruit.